So, good afternoon, and apologies for the slight delay. We can't always rely on lights, but um, we're here now, and that's the main thing. Um, you're all very, very welcome to the IIEA. Firstly, on some procedural issues, this is a recording event, both the speech and the question and answer session. So, if you haven't done so already, please put your mobile phone on silent, but feel free to tweet at IIEA. Today's event is part of our Future of the EU 27 project, supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And the Future of the EU 27 team here at the Institute is delighted to welcome our speaker today, Professor Danita Huber, MEP. Professor Huber will be speaking on Facing the Future, the new EU strategic agenda and the European Parliament's priorities for the next five years. Professor Hubner, MEP, has been a member of the European Parliament since 2009, and she holds a number of influential roles in the European Parliament, including Chair of the Committee on Constitutional Affairs and a member of the Parliament's Brexit Steering Group. From 2004 to 2009, Professor Hubner served as Commissioner for Regional Policy, making her Poland's first ever European Commissioner, and previous to that, Professor Hubner served in several roles in the Polish government, including as Minister for European Affairs. So, Danuta, welcome. Uh, Dzień dobry. Proszę uh, bardzo. I'm not sure if that's totally no, correct in Polish, but welcome, Kate Me the Falcha to Dublin. Um, Danuta, your political career has been at the heart of European politics, and you're speaking at a time when Europe is perhaps at a critical juncture. We've just experienced uh, just after the European elections, but there's still many things in flux. So your dress is important in terms of where Europe is heading and where it's heading in the future. So I would like to invite you to speak on Facing the Future, the EU's new strategic agenda and the European Parliament's priorities. Okay, I think you think I can go Yeah, you're welcome to speak at the podium. Just I don't know how those two mics will work together, but I hope. Uh, well, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Uh, unfortunately, you have invited me in the moment when there's no answer to any question yet. So it just, I don't know anything actually, if you could, if I, if can, I can say it. So first of all, I apologize for being late, but it was one hour delay in Frankfurt. And then uh, they kept us on the plane here for t more than 20 minutes because there was no parking place for the, for the plane. No gate was free, nothing. So it was just, and then we had a mar marvelous, a wonderful um, driver who just made it in 10 minutes, I think, here. So first of all, I would like to maybe share with you some very personal takeouts from the elections because I also had to do elections at home and we have in Poland, uh, which is my home country, a uh, real election. So if you want to be a member of European Parliament, you, you just have to fight. We have districts, we have lists, and you have to, and we have preferential lists, so um, this is quite a, quite a challenge. And then I, I read a lot of comments on, on the elections across Europe, and I think that I would like to start with uh, sharing my three or four takeaways take from the elections, which are probably very personal. Um, uh, but I, 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 I think I see them as, as important for the future of, um, uh, of Europe. I think we all know that those elections were, uh, I also think here, slightly different if you compare them with the previous or even with the uh, last ones. Uh, of course, there was a higher turnout in general, which is good because then the uh, legitimation of our of the members of European Parliament, it just grows. Uh, we are more important, and also it showed that maybe people have more interest now in, in European uh, Parliament, if this is a new trend, because it may be that it was just a one-off uh, event, this higher uh, participation. But I think what was, for me at least, the most important is that uh, I, I think this time around, it was not, not just 28 separate stories in 28, uh, member states, the, the elections, the discussions during the uh, elections. As usual, there were local components very strong, I think, across uh, across uh, Europe. But at the same time, there was uh, there were very clear expectations expressed by the citizens uh, directed towards um, uh, European uh, Union. I think uh, this time uh, people uh, very clearly saw gains from the. Uh, from being part of Europe, gains coming from the integration, European uh, integration. And I think that uh, I would draw the conclusion from this that uh, European citizens, Europeans, uh, now they just don't want Europe just to survive. 
uh, on the, um, I would say, on the old crumbs of past glory, but uh, they clearly, I think, from this election, these elections, we can uh, see that people clearly want uh, Europe to live and, uh, and deliver, um, and I think that uh, they expect responses um, to their concerns from the European um, uh, Union. And I think that, uh, as a result, people put on the European agenda across Europe the same or very similar issues. So it was not like 28 different stories, as I uh, said, but it's just the same issues were put uh, on our European table in, in, in all member states. My second takeaway would be that, um, in spite of, of the fact that uh, we indeed have more, people say Eurosceptics, I think just uh, we should say anti-European parties and movements and anti-European members of European Parliament, they came in bigger uh, numbers, um, the size of this group is bigger or will be uh, bigger, but still I believe we have a, there is a good chance to have a very constructive, uh, very committed and engaged uh, European Parliament with a solid, stable, pro-European uh, majority. Um, uh, but uh, th this, uh, the next five years will be a, a test for this group, whether, they, whether we will uh, be able to, to stick uh, together, to build uh, capacity to compromise and to have a common, um, see Europe as, as a common really good and uh, have the same similar perspective for, uh, for Europe. Uh, and that we will manage to avoid the uh, sort of creeping disagreements, disengagements or fragmentation of uh, European uh, Parliament. I, I think this will be uh, very important that we pass this test, but there is a chance that we can make this, uh, these five years to come really good years for uh, Europe. My third uh, takeaway would be that uh, these elections actually uh, gave um, clear for me evidence that uh, a new type of um, democratic practice uh, is emerging in, in Europe. We have sort of, we could see a sort of network or open source uh, democracy based on um, solidarity of various uh, uh, groups. Uh, th this has become, I think, a, a canvas and a, and a harbinger of, of new European uh, democracy that from below can push the populist uh, back. Uh, and th this, uh, this democracy, this is about all the grassroots organizations, there were active women uh, movements, uh, climate activists, we, had, we have seen very active urban um, activists uh, during those uh, elections, also the people of culture, the creative uh, part of our society was also very uh, very active and first of all there was more w w young people and it's not only uh, Greta with her climate um, uh, commitment but uh, it's, it's also other young uh, people that have come to, uh, to, to the meetings that came to the streets also uh, and um, showed some interest in at least parts of what Europe uh, can offer or can uh, deliver. So I think there is a chance now uh, that European uh, Union uh, will be um, uh, delivering its policies now through this network democracy now in a different uh, way, uh, which is also updating um, what we understand by subsidiarity. I think that there is a chance that uh, subsidiarity is going to be more about sharing uh, than saying to Europe just hands off um, uh, from our local uh, reality. So I guess that we, we have seen in the, during those elections some sort of reinterpretation of democratic practices and uh, with, uh, with this wider participation of, uh, of local level. Uh, and I think this can change also the way we, uh, we, we do politics or we make political decisions or decisions in general in, in Europe. And I'm under lining this because I think that, I don't know, the oldest of you might remember we used to talk about European demos or lack of it for years, then we stopped talking about it. But I think now it's, it looks like European demos is coming into being, but s not through 
uh, what we were always uh, discussing, this uh, imposed uh, top-down European identity, but through the gathering of people, of Europeans around uh, very concrete expectations, common expectations, uh, policies and, and achievements. So um, that, that, uh, I, I, that's not the only optimistic part of my uh, introductory remarks, but, but I think that uh, there is a chance that if we continue to be smart enough as uh, politicians or as Europeans, uh, there is a chance that uh, these elections uh, can uh, uh, also bring a sort of new beginning to, to the way uh, Europe uh, will, will function in the years uh, to come. Now, my second issue that I would like to share with you is, is um, to comment maybe uh, about the, where we are with the preparation of the next uh, agenda or uh, for, for the, the agenda for the next uh, five years. A, a lot has been done, I think, before the elections and also already now during these months after the uh, elections. And uh, most of European institutions, it's not only the Commission, the Council, the Parliament, but also the Committee of the Regions, the Economic and Social uh, Committee, they have been uh, involved um, uh, as well. And I think, as usual, the, the, the whole thing of preparing the agenda, the political agenda for the years to come, has started with the, uh, with the Commission who, uh, that prepared this contribution, communication, uh, before the European Council meeting in, in Sibiu. Uh, where, as usual, the Commission is doing just we, there was a clear um, stock taken of where the EU stands uh, today, so looking on the, uh, on the last, on the recent uh, legislature and seeing what uh, uh, remains as unfinished um, uh, business, but also uh, looking toward the future with very clear recommendations uh, for the a strategic agenda of the Council, which usually once every five years in June makes this decision on the strategic agenda. This year for the first time will be different because we have now a, a new uh, sort of approach to, to this um, multi-annual programming in the European uh, Union. But the Commission has uh, put on the, on the table five major recommendations of building uh, Europe that would be, that will be, that should be uh, protective, uh, competitive, uh, then fair, um, sustainable and globally influential. That sounds uh, very generally, but then a lot of details have come and I think uh, this language was also taken largely from what President Macron was saying over the last uh, months, I think, and, uh, uh, but, but this is, I think, a very convincing um, uh, coverage of, uh, of the major challenges uh, through pointing to those issues, these five issues that I uh, mentioned. Additionally, also the Commission, and I think rightly so, uh, put a lot of emphasis on the need to, um, uh, to care about the transparency of the way we function in the European uh, Union, specifically in, uh, in the institutions, and also continued emphasis on the eff effective communication. So this uh, dialogue with, uh, with people, I think these are lessons, conclusions, I think drawn, drawn from the experience of the last two years, basically, of communicating with, uh, with people, engaging them in a more permanent uh, dialogue. Uh, I don't know if you follow, but we had over the last two years uh, both at the level of member states and different institutions, the national parliament, but also governments have been organizing uh, real debates, um, public debates on, on Europe. There was a uh, commission unprecedentedly, I think, was present in uh, all uh, member states for, for tens of, if not hundreds of, of meetings with commissioners. Uh, so we had uh, also uh, this and, and the, even the council uh, uh, have, has been involved in, in this uh, dialogue with, uh, uh, with people on all the most important um, uh, issues. Um, and then uh, I, I think the, the proposal coming from the Commission for, the, for this agenda, uh, then picked up largely by the, uh, by the Council, was also very detailed and I, uh, I think we, we probably could see also in, in media, but uh, 
depending on the member state, uh, media have been more or less interested in passing to the uh, people also the, those boring uh, conclusions of the, uh, of the meetings. But I think we, uh, we responded in this um, in, in, in the discussion of the future multiannual program um, uh, as presented by, by all institutions, I think we already reacted to what people were also raising during the uh, elections, during the electoral uh, campaign. So we have this focus on, on security, um, uh, broadly understood security. We have also then the focus on the economy. Um, uh, there is the f also the emphasis on the um, newest uh, technologies, um, uh, including the artificial intelligence. Uh, then we have also the continuation of the um, uh, investment in uh, in a single uh, market. Uh, we have also, uh, for the first time, I think, with such a strength, the um, uh, the social uh, pillar, social pi the European Europe, social Europe, or European pillar of social rights. We, we never talked actually um, uh, before um, uh, about the, the issues like access to health or access to affordable uh, housing, uh, access to healthcare, access to affordable uh, housing and working conditions. So I think for the first time this uh, follow-up to the Göteborg uh, decisions a year and a half ago on the social period, this is also being now uh, translated maybe with some um, uh, delay into concrete uh, elements of the uh, next multi-annual uh, programming. And also, I think the, everything that is related to what we again used to call sustainable uh, development, which is now very clearly climate and um, environmental degradation, but not as a climate change, but for the first time, I think, as a climate crisis or catastrophe or something which is around the corner, and we are given by some studies 11 years to, to respond. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, this uh, we have never had, I think, such an emphasis also on uh, these uh, issues. Uh, and then um, the broadly seen, broadly understood also the global um, role of uh, uh, European uh, Union, not only the fight for the um, to protect multilateralism um, and rule uh, based global uh, order but and international trade, uh, but also for the first time we are really paying attention to the international role of of the euro and I think the years to come will will uh, also bring further actions on on uh, in, um, increasing enhancing the international role of the European. Uh, currency and also for the first time I think in this global context Africa has emerged, uh, this alliance between Europe and Africa has emerged as, as, as a very important uh, task. And the good thing is that European Council actually has taken, working parallelly but uh, through the consultation also picked up practically all the, uh, all this, the same issues that the Commission has in more detail uh, put into the um, this discussion uh, about the um, uh, the future. So we have uh, exactly the, the same priorities, uh, the protection of citizens, of freedoms, the uh, developing our economic basis, and uh, then this greener, fairer, more inclusive uh, also um, uh, future uh, and uh, the uh, protection, promo promotion of Europe's interests and values in the global uh, world. If I were to pick up uh, two issues, which I don't know why, why two, but I think two are absolutely, uh, I think, dominating the, the discussions, I would say um, uh, that it, it was this uh, sustainability of, of uh, Europe in terms of uh, climate, environment, but also the social sustainability. So this is something which I think we cannot uh, avoid taking it very seriously in the years uh, to come. And the second issue, which is uh, sometimes, <coughs> especially in the 
uh, depending on to whom you talk in the council, but sometimes it's sort of uh, ignored or um, seen as not that important, but I think it came during the discussions very, very clearly, uh, which is really uh, the protection of European values and especially the rule of law. I think there is no way away of, of, of this. I think this has come as an as, as, as extremely important um, uh, issue. So I, I guess that um, uh, we, we have managed uh, to have the Council and the Commission very quickly sort of converging with their um, uh, the tasks for the, uh, for the future. Also for the, the Euro Summit in the meantime took also place in, in June. So we also have uh, seen this commitment to deepen EMU to, to be more serious about the, um, uh, the finalization of the banking union or to be more serious about also the budgetary instrument for the uh, Eurozone um, and also the revising the ESM treaties. I think issues which have been popping up from time to time since uh, what, already four years ago, I think, when Juncker, when we had this uh, four presidents uh, white paper and the four president reports, and, and these issues have not disappeared. So in spite of lack of a, a clear uh, success in reforming the uh, Eurozone, I think all the issues <laughs> remain uh, on, the, on the agenda. So again, um, I, I, uh, I have this optimistic hope that uh, in spite of the big difference between the North and South, how when they look at the Eurozone, that we also have a, um, a progress on this in the years to come. And then comes the Parliament, uh, where we, uh, it's, it was more difficult for us to get, uh, to focus sort of now over the short term uh, on the, um, um, <laughs> Parliament was, uh, I think, by the fact that we have been uh, in the elector election campaign since practically mid-April, uh, we, we were not working parallelly or together with the two other institutions, as the treaty says, uh, but we got um, into the, uh, this reflection on, uh, on the agenda for the years to come with some delay, but with a lot of, I would say, energy. Um, which was additionally enhanced by the fact uh, that uh, we have been also trying to link this multi-annual programming to the procedure of the lead candidates of the Spitzen uh, candidate. And, and um, that's what the parliament focused over the last months uh, on. So first of all, the leaders of the four main um, uh, groups of the parliament, which is, uh, if I can use the current names, which is EPP, Socialist, um, uh, we still say ALDE, but we normally should already say the Renew Europe and also the, uh, Gre the Greens. They, first of all, they agreed on a, a political process on, on how to uh, define a common ambition for the next legislative uh, period. Uh, in a way, but we did it in such a way um, as um, if that was actually the, um, uh, the basis on which uh, we expect the upcoming president of the European Commission would uh, commit himself or herself um, uh, to, to, to work, um, uh, having at the same time uh, this broad majority of the European Parliament. So we, we saw this program as something that would give the credibility also to the European Parliament uh, candidate for the, um, uh, for the next uh, Commission uh, president. This has never been uh, this way, I think, so, uh, so far, even it's the second time that we try to convince the Council to, uh, to be with us on the, for this procedure of Spitzen uh, candidate, um, and uh, we established the working groups uh, exactly taking on board practically the same, maybe slightly different uh, wording, but the same four or five major areas for the uh, work in the, um, in the future. And we started as the European Parliament normally first to negotiate among our, ourselves uh, to, to negotiate a common approach to those um, uh, issues and doing it in the same time when we are trying to 
constitute ourselves because parliament is now in the process also of constituting itself and itself and it usually starts as you as you can imagine with uh, um, uh, identifying the the major political uh, groups in the parliament so where we are with uh, with this uh, process of constituting the european um, uh, parliament uh, we we need um, we we have um, what we see today, we, we have those uh, seven, actually, uh, political uh, groups that have been already formed, and we still have two major, in terms of size, uh, parties that I call anti-European, but they can be also criticized uh, for this, uh, which is the, uh, the Bre British Brexit uh, Party, which is, I think, 29, uh, they did not yet form a political uh, group, even though in terms of the size they could be alone, but they have to be uh, to have members from seven member states to establish a group. And also we have the Italian uh, Cinque Stelle, also uh, with 14 MEPs, not yet belong, at least yesterday, not yet belonging to, to any political uh, group. And uh, so, so we don't know yet whether they, how they will uh, finally organize uh, themselves. But we already have the European People's Party, which is the biggest, with 182. MEPs, we have socialists and democrats, the two political groups that have, have suffered most, I would say, in the uh, election in terms of the reduction of their size. So the socialists and democrats was 153. Um, the EPP has chosen the German colleague uh, Manfred Weber, who is also our uh, I'm EPP, uh, who is also our candidate for the president of the commission. Uh, the socialist uh, gave up uh, a German colleague and uh, concentrated on supporting the uh, a Spanish uh, colleague from SOE. Um, then we have the former ALDE, which is now the Renew uh, Europe, which has grown compared to, to ALDE uh, size 208 uh, MEPs, and they have elected a former commissioner from Romania, a francophone, um, Dacian Cholos, and also his former um, prime minister of, of Romania as a new leader. Uh, and then we have uh, Greens, they stick to the tradition. Uh, they have grown enormously, I would say, um, up to, to 75 uh, MEPs, mostly thanks to the uh, German um, uh, party. Uh, they, they continue to have two colleagues, um, Ska Keller and uh, Philippe Lambert. Uh, and then we have the, uh, what used to be ENF, the Madame Le Pen uh, group, which is now called Identity and, and Democracy. Um, it's, it's an interesting group because they have uh, also um, uh, the, the biggest um, uh, group of Mr. Salvini, the Liga, uh, the North League, um, uh, and um, Madame Le Pen's party, but also they have like one Czech, one Danish, maybe two, but this type of several parties from Finland, from Czech Republic, from Estonia, I think, and from uh, uh, Denmark, from uh, Netherlands, um, there is also AFD, uh, the Alternative für Deutschland, and uh, uh, and some, also a small party from um, uh, from uh, Netherlands, which I mentioned, I think already. So, so this is a, a group which is uh, 73 MEPs um, and is is going to to play a, a role. And then we have the traditional ECR that, um, but with very few Tories. The Tories were normally dominating this uh, this group, uh, but as they lost uh, terribly actually in UK. Um, uh, now this group is dominated by the Polish ruling uh, party, Law and, and Justice, which they have 26 now, and if the Brits go, they will have 27 um, uh, MEPs. And then we have also the, the GUE, the European United Left, um, uh, and they, they lost, uh, they are one of those uh, that um, together with the EPP and socialists, uh, they have also lost in, the, in terms of the, uh, of the size. So political groups are there. And uh, uh, of those uh, groups, of course, there are the four 
mainstream uh, groups, uh, I mean the EPP socialists, uh, Renew Europe and the Greens, that are negotiating a coalition agreement. So we, we don't talk with everybody, we just try to build this pro-European uh, centre uh, that would uh, try to give this stability pro-European majority to uh, European uh, Parliament. And uh, the discussions are, I would like to say that it's all very noble and with all the big things and Europe, and, uh, but it's also about political deals. It's, it's, it's all now about how to um, make common decisions in a way that would allow us to keep the coalitions and be together, decisions related to, to all the leadership, uh, to all the leader, the positions of leaders of the um, uh, European uh, institutions, and it's not always uh, sort of uh, all uh, easy and uh, um, and uh, easy to to achieve. Uh, and as you probably uh, know, we are nowhere yet. And that's what I was saying that we uh, we don't we don't know. The European Council was not really successful for the time being. Even the idea that Mr. Tusk had. If there is no agreement, if we cannot do it through consensus as we normally do, we just go immediately to vote, and then we will have uh, quick solutions. But then, of course, um, nobody would vote for, because probably we would create even bigger divisions, deeper divisions. So we are uh, we are nowhere uh, there. We also hope that the first uh, uh, decision that will be made will be on the president for the commission, because then it would allow us to look at the rest from the point of view of the traditional European criteria, North, South, East, West, women, non-women, uh, we, we just small, big, and uh, the old, the new, and uh, all those things will have to be taken also into account. But whether the council, European Council will manage to come uh, uh, to a common decision and at the same time not um, uh, sort of ignore the expectations of European Parliament when it comes to Spitzenkandidat and procedure by the end of this month, which is probably Sunday. Uh, we will see, because on uh, Tuesday we will start voting and really the constituting of the European Parliament, which is electing the, the leader, uh, the 14 vice presidents, then also coordinators, chairs of the committees, uh, then of the delegations, and then uh, all, all those uh, things which are um, uh, very complex, but you have to start with something which we normally see um, as the most important, which is the post of the commission uh, president, for which we will also need majority in the uh, European Parliament. And all that comes also in this context of trying to find a compromise on the agenda that I mentioned at the uh, beginning, um, and because we have also different views. Uh, for example, for the speed of climate uh, um, uh, adjustments of our policies, uh, we are not speaking one voice uh, in, in spite of uh, uh, the urgency of the situation. And there are many other issues where we are also uh, having different views. So, so there is this question of constituting ourselves and linking it also with the agenda setting. And I mentioned that for the first time the agenda setting for the five years is a is a novelty and it's uh, because normally the, there is this article 17 I think in the treaty that is saying that the commission initiates the annual and multi-annual uh, programming but with a view to achieve an interinstitutional agreement. And then we in 2016, we negotiated with the Council and with the Commission the Better Lawmaking Interinstitutional Agreement, where we specifically agreed that the um, multi-annual programming is not anymore the Council strategic agenda, which is inspired by the Commission proposal, but it's a joint in interinstitutional uh, multi-annual uh, programming and uh, where also the parliament has to um, uh, contribute to it. And this, uh, after summer, will, will take place. That's why those things are more complex and more interlinked um, uh, to today. And um, uh, I, I think that the uh, European Parliament, as I think in basically there's not really much uh, discrepancies in terms of uh, of uh, the future uh, agenda, but I think the Parliament is more committed, I guess, than 
because of its nature um, as a parliament and as elected and uh, sort of massively elected uh, big group of uh, European uh, members of uh, European institutions, I think we are uh, we feel particularly strongly committed to this need of um, uh, restoring the, the lost confidence and the trust of, of citizens and also to enhance uh, uh, in real terms the transparency of decision um, uh, making and be more committed. We are more committed also to the accountability of uh, all the institutions, agencies, and we have had a whole, the whole series of uh, uh, reports, resolutions over the last uh, two years and also over the last uh, months uh, dedicated to those sort of horizontal characteristics of the way we are making the uh, decisions in European uh, institutions. And, and that's why I think the Parliament will be um, a, probably also a more difficult partner in agreeing on this multi-annual programming after summer than uh, we were um, uh, so, uh, so far. Uh, and uh, I also think that uh, what we share, I guess, among the institutions in the context of the agenda and the context of our actions in the years to come is definitely this uh, um, commitment to stay in dialogue with uh, citizens and to continue the um, uh, the consultations, the real consultation with uh, uh, different stakeholders on, uh, on all the issues, on all decision making. We had a, um, uh, I, I am still for one more day chair of the Constitutional Affairs Committee and before the going to the elections we had at the beginning of uh, April, we had a joint discussion uh, in the European Parliament with the chairs of the, with the people from Committee of the Regions and people from Economic and Social uh, Committee with European Commission, with the uh, Presidency, uh, on how to uh, create um, a, a permanent mechanism uh, for, um, uh, for this uh, debate with people, for the dialogue with people on on European uh, programming, on European uh, decision uh, making, after those two years of, of having those hundreds of, uh, truly hundreds of debates, how to make it a permanent mechanism. And uh, I hope that we will, this will be one of the decisions still to make in the months uh, to come. Um, and I, I hope that we will be able to also keep this network democracy and uh, alive. And I also think just to, to, to come to, to the conclusion of, of, um, uh, of, of my uh, uh, remarks, you remember maybe that I mentioned at the beginning that we had this uh, uh, bigger turnout in the elections and we tr think that this is also uh, showing that um, uh, the importance of European elections is sort of beginning to be uh, appreciated. Uh, but also I think uh, we, I, I, I was uh, also I think clear that I think that populists did not see such big gains as we all expected or fear I would even uh, say. So they will not have a majority blocking minority or um, they will not have a, decisive role in, in shaping the, um, the agenda, the decision uh, making, uh, but they will be there and they will be most likely uh, uh, having the possibility of delaying uh, things, delaying decisions, uh, decision uh, making. So the parliament will have to look for uh, new working methods to make the functioning uh, smooth and efficient. Um, and also uh, be politically committed to compromises and to uh, within the, uh, this pro-European uh, majority. And I would just like to mention one one uh, one issue to uh, in, in this uh, context. We normally use the don't procedure, this horrible blind don't system uh, to um, allocate the. Um, chairmanship of the committees among political groups. And we have done it, and we, through this don't blind procedure, we have, for example, committees like um, jury committee, which is this legal affairs uh, committee, that is allocated to Madame Le Pen group. 
so, for example, then it will be um, the question will be whether we can uh, we can stick to to this traditional use of uh, of don't to allocate the posts in the parliament, or we have to go for something which I would call more confrontation confrontational confrontational um, a settlement and uh, and uh, just uh, vote or outvote, which normally we don't do. Uh, because once there is this don't allocation, then by acclamation, the chairs of the committees are uh, appointed. So we will face this challenge should the agricultural committee and the jury committee go to a clearly anti-European um, a group or, or uh, sh so it's just also this type of, uh, of um, uh, challenges we are also uh, facing uh, and uh, we believe that democracy is very important, diversity shows also that democracy, democracy is, is, is working but can we also take this uh, risk uh, to see that uh, the committees that um, are in a way also paving the way for decisions uh, made by European um, institutions um, to respond to expectations of European uh, citizens and w what should be, what kind of working methods we should have uh, to see that uh, Europe is moving forward and uh, um, uh, th this is one of those challenges should be also financed from uh, European budget. Uh, all those who, who come to European Parliament to dismantle European Parliament or to um, undermine the uh, strengths of uh, European Union. So this efficiency of work and the benefits of, of citizens, the responsibility for the future of Europe, all those things will have to be taken into account where we will be uh, also just addressing step by step those difficult moments also in the months uh, to come. There will be also the question of the British uh, parliamentarians who, as you know, are in the European uh, Parliament with uh, very different proportions, with uh, many more um, uh, liberals, with also socialists, with uh, limited Tory, uh, Tories uh, number of, of the Tories, and with huge increase of the Mr. Farage uh, group. And we don't know uh, when and whether uh, the British colleagues will uh, will leave. And now they are also part of of the whole process of. Uh, of uh, the participation in the distribution of uh, posts. So I'm not just trying, to, I'm trying to avoid a, a evaluation of this, but just I'm showing also uh, the process. Nevertheless, the legislative process as it is in the treaty is not changed. So the parliament will, uh, will continue uh, with its role uh, as it is in the current treaties. Uh, there is even less appetite now, I think, for the treaty uh, change. Uh, not because of the Irish uh, this time, I think, around, but we are also thinking that um, uh, today the treaty change can, could finally could lead also to um, uh, the re reduction of Europe, if I can say, just um, in, in, this, uh, in this way. So we are, uh, I, I think there is, uh, there will be, we will continue with this idea of uh, going to introducing the changes, especially to the governance of the Eurozone, without changing uh, the treaties. That, I think, will, will stay with us for uh, quite, um, uh, quite, a, quite a while, especially when it comes to the Eurozone. I think uh, most of the reforms, if not all of them, that are on the table for the time being, they can be introduced without changing the, um, uh, the treaty. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the only thing that I probably should say at the end is that the, the most difficult thing for us will be exactly this, whether we will pass the exam as the pro-European majority in terms of really being united. It's going to be extremely difficult, but I, I think the only way to, uh, to go. And I also think that European integration is a sort of, I don't know if it's correct in English, human process in the sense it's men and women made uh, process and it depends um, seriously on, on, on those who make 
the effort to conceive uh, and implement uh, the change. Uh, but I also think that we are, after the last years and all the problems with the rule of law across uh, um, especially um, part of um, of Europe, um, we, we see that uh, democracy is is based on a sense of belonging to to one community of values, and I, I think this will be um, I, I think a very shared values. This will be a very important thing to to remember because we know that if the if we lose values, then also we are also uh, lost. So I, I think I took you through main uh, dilemmas that we have right now in the European uh, Parliament. I didn't mention practically the word Brexit, but, but it is with us, and, and the Brits will be with us around the table, and we will be making all those difficult uh, decisions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Professor Hubner. Uh, I think you touched on a wide ranging uh, issues and challenges within uh, the European Union, not just looking at the, uh, the outcome of the European elections, but um, the different processes of coalition building that will go on, of course, in the Parliament. But also that fact on uh, Europeans and that we should take more responsibility and that maybe Europe uh, is not just about uh, to, to survive, but how we deliver and how po politicians and policy makers um, should deliver on promises and to be cognizant of that. Um, and then maybe there's a different kind of change going on as well, a new kind of democracy happening in terms of democracy from below that could possibly uh, push back pop populism and then focus on um, our European um, values. Um, I know I have a lot of questions, but I would like to open it up to the floor uh, for maybe if we could take, uh, we have about 10 minutes or so for, for questions, so I'll take maybe three at a time. Would you be happy to answer three, and then we'll see if we have uh, time for more. There is a microphone there going around, yes, and um, just please remember to speak directly into the microphone before you speak, um, just so that we can pick it up, and also just state your name and affiliation as well. Thank you. Just here at the top, Imogen. John Bruton, I'm a member of the Institute. Um, I'd just like to ask about the Spitzen candidate. Um, there seems to be a growing consensus that uh, Manfred Weber will not become president of the Commission. Uh, this seems to involve a, a breakdown in the coalition before the coalition is formed in the sense that uh, the Social Democrats and the Greens also put forward candidates uh, in competition with Manfred Weber. He got more seats, and now that having happened, it looks as if they'll vote against him when the implication previously that would vote for him. Now, I think the Spitzen candidate system is flawed in many ways, but for good or ill, it was the system that was chosen and presented to the people before the election as the way the President of the Commission was going to be chosen. And if after the election, the European institutions decide they're going to dump all of that, forget what we said before the election, we're going to do something different after the election, that will not, I think, contribute to trust in the European institutions. How is that matter going to be resolved? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another one here at the back. Yeah. Uh, Donald Brallacon, member of the Institute, following on that question. Um, um, the, you mentioned that the Dawn system may not be used uh, for uh, appointing chairman, uh, chairs of committees, because you don't like the results that... I mean, what's the point in voting for the European Parliament if, you know, you then change the results? As, as uh, John Bruton said, that's another lack of trust. And the other thing I'd just like to add, that the continuation of uh, intergovernmentalism and the community method resolving matters and the uh, on, on the Eurozone, it's all done in secrecy. And as you know better than I do, that the European Ombudsman um, uh, had a very critical report on the transparency of EU Council uh, members. And I'm not aware that uh, there has been any response to that, but maybe I don't follow it closely enough. Um, one last point, then to go back to the European Demos, the previous Constitutional Affairs Committee held hearings on basically a form of direct democracy uh, in September 2012. And uh, there was um, uh, obviously, that's part of the ECI 
and it was basically, it, it was hearings, it was, there was no outcome as such, but uh, it does show a different way of, I'll use the word, bringing in new mechanisms that may restore trust in how we govern ourselves at European level. Okay. And just one over here. If you just come to the front. Thank you. Uno Dwyer, member of the Institute. Thank you, Professor Hoopner, for a excellent updating on the situation in the Parliament at the moment. Uh, I, I also want to address the issue of the Spitzenkandidat, but from a slightly different angle, and I don't entirely agree with uh, Mr. Mr. Bruton's views on this, on this matter. Um, I'm a, as a former Commission official dealing with interinstitutional relations, I was always very supportive of the Parliament's efforts and successful at that to involve itself more and more in the decision making process at the EU level. However, I have problems with the Spitzenkandidat process and it, the problem I think for the Parliament is that it isn't enshrined in the treaties and you know therefore if you want to make it work you're going to have to be very careful in, in your, you have to be tactically good and create a precedent in terms of procedure and an acceptance in general terms of the whole way the business is done, as indeed is many other procedures in the EU. Many other procedures in the EU. And I think last time round, the Parliament played a blinder, or rather the EPP group played a blinder, by producing a candidate, Mr Juncker, that the EPP members of the European Council couldn't refuse. They just, you know, he was a, obviously ticked all the boxes. But this time round, I'm very curious to know as to what was the actual argument really, apart from just uh, personal preferences that Mr. Weber was chosen in the European elections in Ireland, n the name was never mentioned. You can't possibly say that it was a democratic, that w whether or not EPP members from Ireland were voted, it had nothing to do with Mr. Weber as a candidate. And I really think that this, was, this is almost anti-democratic in the sense of insisting on a person who didn't even bother coming to Ireland to do a campaign on his, uh, in his favour. It, it really requires better handling in order for the, such a procedure to succeed. And I can quite understand why it hasn't worked this time round and why it did work last time round. Mm -hmm. And it is a pity from the Parliament's own point of view that they weren't a little bit... In fact, we did see that Mr. Timmermans did very well in his own country as well as elsewhere. I mean, he was part of uh, the, the right kind of approach, but unfortunately that was not the EPP's approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to... Oh, okay. well, Do you want to... The paper was selected at an open convention where all the parties voted. I was there. And it was, he, there was a debate and there was a vote. And he won at the EPP convention. It, and that was all done in public, so it's nothing private. <coughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Do you want to answer so, yeah, this? Just, yeah, I'll just, yeah. Of course, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, um, uh, to I, I guess, to, to respond to your concerns because I also disagree with some of them. But I also think that um, it's impossible to explain to the public um, that we ignore now Spitzenkandidat and after the whole... Uh, process of elections. I know maybe Weber didn't come here, but I would be surprised actually because Dana Murphy, who is, was responsible for EPP electoral campaign, that he didn't bring Man Man uh, Manfred Weber here. I just, uh, I don't know, maybe it was not uh, well publicized uh, here, but I think he was uh, traveling a lot and he was everywhere and in many member states for many times. So I, I, I'm not sure that if we made an effort ourselves, uh, those who belong to the party, to the political group at national level, to promote also the candidate, uh, then probably he would be known and, and seen and, and uh, visible. Not all the Spitzen were participating in the elections. Margaret, Mrs. Vestager did not. She decided not to run in the elections. Nevertheless, she, she was one of the liberals, and finally she is the liberal uh, candidate um, of the uh, Renaissance, uh, Renew Europe uh, candidate for as the, as the, as the Spitzen. Um, but in principle, I think the idea of, of Spitzen was the candidate and was to, 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 to have for the voters 
somebody who would be <coughs> associated with the values and with the program that we individuals uh, from participating in the elections that we would like to convince the public to vote for us because our candidate will then be the president of the European uh, Commission and would not ignore what is important uh, for the people, uh, what people present uh, during the uh, meetings during the electoral uh, <coughs> campaign uh, to the candidates. So, uh, in fact, to think that there is this uh, Spitzen uh, candidate who is uh, representing a program that uh, on which we win the elections uh, belonging to the same uh, political uh, group, and then we are the winner in the European Parliament, the biggest group, and we won on the basis of a program that also this uh, guy or, uh, is, is also representing, then I think it shouldn't be ignored because that's exactly the leading to the lack of, of trust. So I think once we embark on this process of uh, Spitzen candidate, and then I think it should be run to the very end. I disagree that it's because in the council it's often used, it doesn't come from the treaty. But the treaty is not specific on how you take into account the results of the elections. You can take it into account also by respecting the fact that um, uh, the candidate <coughs> is presented uh, by, uh, by a political group that is also having uh, its representatives in the, in the European uh, Council. So I think we can uh, build a, a legally safe, uh, uh, I think, environment, political environment for the process. So I don't buy the argument that it doesn't come uh, from the treaty, and the treaty gives total freedom to uh, the European Council to do what the Council wants, because that's not really uh, true. However, the, the, the candidate uh, of EPP, it's true that um, uh, has not been accepted by um, some colleagues were in the European Council were very strong from the very beginning. It was publicly, it was in newspapers. Uh, especially from the France, Portugal, Spain, that they will never accept a candidate uh, which EPP has uh, presented. So uh, there is a political uh, discussion. Uh, candidates are not uh, accepted. Um, and uh, this comes from the fact that the European Council is accustomed to choose somebody who is with them around the table because they already had uh, relationship, had exchanges, they develop sort of uh, trust and they want to uh, focus on this on this candidate. So there are many arguments and uh, it's difficult to, in political discussion, to ignore somebody's uh, opinions. That's why we are today where we are, when there is no, no uh, support, no endorsement for the EPP candidate in the uh, European uh, Council. I don't know whether this can change or, or not. Uh, there are also the uh, ideas that uh, we uh, can uh, think of the Spitzenkandidaten as if they are also selected by the governments as candidates for commissioners, that they could join the commission, uh, for example, as vice president of the commission, and the, the council could come up with somebody, a proposal that the parliament would um, vote positively that would be from outside this group of Spitzen. So they are. I think that, that there is an effort, political effort, to find a solution. Uh, it's true that there is this novelty with some of the candidates has been that the traditionally John will support me, you have uh, even longer memory than I do, that we accept for the law, we never had a president of the commission that would not be the former prime minister, I think, no? That's, uh, uh, but Delors, uh, Jacques Delors had sort of different qualities that probably um, uh, led at that time to, to making him the uh, president of the commission. So, so uh, th there is also this, um, uh, this factor which informally some of the uh, members of European Council mentioned, but uh, I, I don't know whether this will be finally also taken into, into account. But that's where we are. We, we just have to find a an agreement between the two institutions. Um, and somebody, I think it was John, or, uh, who mentioned that it's not only the Council versus the European Council versus Parliament, but it's also within the Parliament finding the, um, uh, the agreement. And from the very beginning, we, we didn't have this um, uh, disagreement. Uh, uh, th there is a s sort of 
um, fatigue, I would say, with, with this domination of two uh, major political groups uh, for decades in the European Union. Whether this is true or not, uh, I'm not sure uh, that uh, those groups are, are sort of seen as, as uh, really not taking sufficiently into account the, uh, the democracy, meaning that uh, they, are, they have just been the uh, the Grand Coalition was just part of the European Parliament. But the Grand Coalition didn't work already, doesn't work already now. In this, over the last uh, five years, we, we didn't have the traditional Grand Coalition between EPP and Socialists in the sense that it's a coalition for the whole period and for the entire approach to, to our tasks. We, we just had to build majorities already now for practically every project, every uh, piece of legislation, every initiative, uh, um, so it didn't work already, so there was already much more in terms of democracy, I think. Um, uh, but I don't, I'm sorry, but it's just so complex. Why Grand Coalition is not democracy? It's also democracy. But as we know, democracy is where uh, the uh, interests of minorities are also taken into account. And I, uh, I guess this uh, probably... Um, is also related to how complex the functioning of the European Parliament is. At a national level, you just have coalition and opposition, and it's very clear. In the European Parliament, you have to build a compromise and majority for a, every piece of whatever you want to vote or accept. And uh, uh, we always start from uh, scratch, and we build this uh, compromise. Um, and even if you had a grand coalition, you also had to build a compromise within the grand coalition. As I said for the last time, we built for everything the, uh, uh, the compromise. So, so it's very, very different. And I think some of the national leaders who have not been through the European Parliament in their life, um, I think they don't understand also this uh, major uh, difference in functioning of the uh, and the importance of majority building in the European Parliament. That's why uh, they think that it's such a procedure that if there is a majority in the Council, that automatically you have also the same majority in the, which is not uh, not the case. So I am not. Um, uh, I, I am uh, um, thinking that if we manage to get the transnational lists, also in the votes. Uh, over the last five years, I think we voted. I'm sorry, I'm a loser of this because I was the author of the reports also on, on, uh, that included the transnationalists. If we had managed to, um, to convince, especially my political group, to, to accept the transnationalists, then we will have also, I think, a stronger support in the European Council for the Spitzen as chairing the transnationalists, and that will be easier. But as we uh, outvoted transnationalists, and they have they are now sort of left in somewhere in the political space to address later. Uh, we I, I think it's also linked. So I'm sorry, I cannot just give you the. Um, there's no one answer to what will uh, will happen. As you, as you probably know, there's a lot of uh, candidates, but the challenge of getting the majority in the European Parliament exists, and we will need this majority. And if you uh, can you reach a majority that would vote positively the President of the Commission without EPP, you, you can probably get everybody on board if you if you manage, but that would be politically, I think, a big mistake. That's why we will uh, probably spend more time on, on electing the uh, President of the Commission. I don't ignore don't. I, I would never say that. I was just saying that we use don't, and we use also now don't, and I'm just thinking uh, with a curiosity also whether uh, in the committees where we will have the uh, colleagues coming from, um, but because don't does not forbid to vote in the committee when you have the proposal for a chair of the committee that is agreed among political groups who follow the, the don't, you, somebody can still say, I want to vote. And, and you, you don't do it through acclamation, but you vote. And then I can imagine that there will be colleagues who, seeing um, as a proposal uh, coming from Don't, a proposal, a candidate for a chair that comes from a group or is himself when asked questions, because there will be the exchange of views, who will say uh, his views on Europe that will be dramatically different from the views of the majority that, that he can or she can be outvoted. And uh, this is just legally correct. And, but I'm not saying that 
uh, if don't uh, replaces um, uh, democracy, I'm saying don't reflect, mess, it's a method of democracy that we are using, but it can be that it's not accepted by the, by the colleagues, and things like that already happened in the past, so, uh, because it just happened because probably the jury committee, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Just, uh, now, you said um, uh, also the uh, transparency, this we, I, I think we, we, we have committed a lot of time to the transparency over the uh, last uh, five uh, years. We had also um, Madame Ombudsman, whom you know here uh, very well, she was also very, for the first time, I think, very committed to and the report on the council on the, um, and the, the results. The council has, I, till April, they did not respond, simply. That's why we don't know the response. I, I, I haven't seen the uh, response. I think the issues will continue. On ECI, we did a uh, reform. Uh, it's not as uh, I was myself negotiating, uh, trying to convince the council to move uh, uh, further uh, towards our ideas and the commission on, on uh, modernizing the ECI. We managed to get some uh, changes. I hope ECI will be European Citizens Initiative will be more uh, sort of more often used in an effective uh, way. Uh, but it's not yet what we would like to, to see. But I hope there is a chance that uh, we can use it more efficiently to get trust of people and get um, themselves more uh, more involved. We, we did a lot. We had many um, uh, debates and hearings about the democracy, about referenda, about uh, many aspects of of, um, of the functioning of the European Union and also the tri um, scope for the treaty change, scope for the reform within the. Uh, treaties. Um, uh, so I, I think we, we, we will continue the reforms, uh, the reforms of the European Union. But I don't believe I'm. I'm very much in favor of changing this treaty change of just not having it as a taboo anymore. Uh, and because we know that even the Irish can be convinced to accept the treaty. Uh, change, but I, I, it's not cynically what I'm going to say is cynical, but I don't think we, we can expect, because there will be the, I'm bluntly saying you, there will be this fear that there is a treaty change. I know what kind of proposal for treaty change might come from some governments in the, that would be just reducing the, uh, the, the integration and going towards intergovernmentalism much more than it is uh, so far and against solidarity in the context of migration and against the, the moving forward towards uh, climate, against the, uh, the qualified majority in new areas that the Commission has proposed which the Parliament is supporting. That's why for different reasons we are not afraid of uh, the Irish voting against, we are now afraid of, of having as a result of the discussion on the, on, on the reopening of the treaty, we can have results that would be worse than, uh, than we would like to, to see. That's why I think it will be again blocked, but maybe I'm totally uh, wrong. So I, um, on Spitzen, I don't have much to, uh, to say, I must say. Um, more, I, um, I would, I'm not obsessed with Spitzen, I think, but, uh, but the, whatever you call it, but the idea of having this debate and having the program and having them as part of the, this is something which we should protect, I think, because that's exactly what would make uh, the Com European Commission also a, a sort of more um, seen as more democratic and elected institution than uh, as a bureaucrat, but we are not yet there probably. Thank you. Uh, Danuta, um, let's touch on so many issues there and a very complicated issue, but unfortunately we don't, we've run out of time and we don't have uh, time for any more questions, even though I know you've touched on, on a lot of um, concerns there and perhaps we'll know more and definitely... But it's in not the, for in me, the, it's in not the, because of me you don't have time, no, it's just because of you here. The, yeah, for your okay. schedule and to get your uh, flight as well. No, no, this is not. A, no, I'm just saying that don't use me as no, an no, excuse. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, I'm sure everybody would like to ask you another question, but unfortunately, this uh, for our schedule, we we don't have time, and, and it, it would be great if we did. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Denise Professor Denise Hooper, MEP, um, and thank my colleague um, Claire Gray for arranging this event as well. Thank you.